Okay, I've just got a few more questions that were left over from the anterior webinar that we ran a few weeks ago. Uh, some of the questions I haven't answered yet, so I thought I'd go through and answer some of those uh, now. Uh, here's one that says, when you send the patient home with provisionals for getting used to, do you bond them permanently? Okay, there's no such, we never use the word permanent in dentistry because everything wears out. No matter what you do, unless the patient dies, it will wear out. So stop using the word permanent, there's the first thing. Uh, with a provisional, there's about 10 different ways I can do it. So if it's like a, sometimes it's worth, uh, like for crown and bridge cases that, where there's a lot of complex things, it's worth taking out all of the old dentistry, doing core build-ups, doing a whole set of new temporaries in either acrylic or bisacryl, and then, yes, in those cases, the, the temporaries are cemented with temp bond or whatever. <clears throat> in cases where you're doing a mock-up, then the mock-up often I will do and then instantly cut off, okay? It's only there for a very short time. If you want the patient to trial a mock-up, then you either need to make temporaries that can be removed, that are cleansable, or you can do bonded temporaries that, that are bonded, okay? So the answer to that question is it depends. If you need to have the case with long-term temporaries that the patient has in their mouth and they get to function and so on before you do any tooth preparation, then of course they need to be bonded or they're going to fall off. Uh, <clears throat> I quite often use, I use a whole range of techniques. You can fill the interproximals with Teflon tape and then do a, some type of clear, um, either clear silicon or clear septum full of composite and then you etch and bond and cure that over the teeth and then clean it up. I find that if you do that you have to clean up in between the teeth for hours and hours and hours and hours and it's very difficult. <clears throat> Alternatively you can uh, do this tooth by tooth with clear silicon. You put Teflon on the adjacent teeth, silicon mould, have a little hole drilled through it, you etch and bond and then inject flowable. I think that was um, uh, method popularised by one of the videos by Enrique Guzman. Uh, <clears throat> so, the answer is it depends on what you're trying to achieve. <clears throat> Would you contend that shape trumps shade in most cases? Shape, okay, the answer to that is no, not in all cases. Most of the time, shape is more important than shade, uh, at least to us dentists. Now, sometimes to the patient, they just care that it's white and they don't care how white or whether it looks like a human species or not. Uh, <clears throat> but most of the time shape is more important than shade, uh, unless the shade is awful, in which case that. Now if the patient has very funny ideas about shade, like they want them, you know, bleach white minus seven, then in those cases the uh, shade will trump shape. Now sometimes patients also want stuff to look fake. If they want it to look fake, make it look fake. If you try and make it look natural when they want it to look fake, then they'll be unhappy. That's why you should try stuff. Okay, can you please explain bonded versus cemented crown on a short tooth with lack of palatal enamel and your rationale for the decision between them? <clears throat> okay, if you have a lack of a palatal enamel and you're going to do a cemented crown, then you'll need to crown lengthen the lingual. Um, on the palate, that's a bit tricky because the tissue tends to rebound, so you need to not only remove the bone, but you need to really cut the tissue back a lot as well. Uh, so mostly you'll do crown lengthening on the palate side of the teeth. You'll also need to do a gingivectomy a second time. <clears throat> Um, bonded, you don't want to rely on bonding to dentine where you've got a long crown on a short tooth. So if you're going to have short teeth, you really want to have, uh, with long crowns on them, you need to have some decent ferrule whether you're doing bonding or not. That's it. Those sort of questions, I really need to see the case because there's so many factors that you're considering. It's not just a rule. You need to have the case to look at. Uh, it, it would depend on, I mean, your first thing we're going to look at is the patient's face. You know, do they have big masseters? Do they look like someone who bruxes or clenches with enormous force? If they do, then it won't really matter what you do, it's going to break. So the answer to that question is you have to assess all the factors and then decide. I mean, if you've got somebody who's very delicate on their teeth, then you can do anything. But if, you, if they put a lot of pressure on their teeth, they're going to break it no matter what you do. And so you want to build it as strong as possible. <clears throat> what is the sausage technique you mentioned? Sausage technique is where teeth touch but they're worn and we run a sausage of composite across all six lower anteriors and we shape it up and then we cure them all at once so that now the six teeth are joined together and then you get a little fine diamond burr and you cut grooves. I posted a case on Ripe recently, so go and find that case. You cut little grooves, interproximal in the um, 
comps it and then we put an instrument between the teeth and crack it apart and diamond strip. It allows you to build all six teeth at a single visit, a single time, and you can usually do it in like 30, 40 minutes, very quick. <clears throat> I can't really explain that without a whole webinar. Maybe I'll do a whole webinar on sausage technique. What type of ceramic would you use to mask dark and discoloured stumps? So dark and discoloured stumps are extremely difficult no matter what ceramic you use. Obviously if you use porcelain fused to metal, it's going to be opaque, but then you get all the problems with the metal. If you do porcelain fused to zirconia, most zirconias are, have a slight translucency, so you can have problems with the colour coming through. <clears throat> um, if you use Emacs that's opaque, then you often have to cut it back and layer it so it doesn't look fake. So pretty much everything for dark teeth is difficult. You can bleach the teeth, but then you can't be sure that it will stay bleached and it might go black again after you put the crown on. So pretty much if the tooth is black, it's never going to look quite right. If you want it to look absolutely perfect, you would need to pull the tooth out and do an implant, okay? But then if the implant goes wrong, then you could have massive scar tissue. So <clears throat> everything can go wrong. You have to remember that cosmetic dentistry is easy to do on teeth that look good in the first place. So if the patient's teeth look ugly, it's much harder to make them look nice than if they look good. If the teeth look, you'll notice that some of the really fancy cases on Facebook are done on people who have teeth that are basically nice and level and hardly anything wrong. Um, whereas a lot of my cases tend to be on patients whose teeth are crooked, are discoloured, there's everything going wrong and those cases are just really hard. <clears throat> what would be the actual cause of sensitivity in the bonding protocol and would you do anything differently? So basically if you bond in a crown or you bond in a composite or you bond in anything or you cement it and it's sensitive straight afterwards, you've messed up the bonding or the cementing. Um, it is not a recipe. Very rarely do you need to go back and do root canal therapy. That's just kind of trying to hide your mistake. Um, <clears throat> most of the time the problem is that you have uh, mess it up. So if you have sensitive to cold after bonding a crown in, you need to cut the crown off and do it again. That's the answer. Uh, you've usually got either moisture contamination or you over dried the dentine before you put the bonding agent on or you didn't put enough primer. They're the usual things. <clears throat> okay, maybe I should do a webinar on that too. Is it okay to do implants in a patient with a huge masseter's squashed face and worn out all these teeth. Yes, you can do it, you just need to tell them they're going to wear out and they're going to break it and they're going to chip it. Okay, patients who have large masseters, a square face, um, heavy wear everywhere, the key factor is to tell them that they're going to break everything you do. They've broken the teeth that nature gave them and you are not better than nature. So those patients <coughs> are going to break everything. You try and design it all to be really strong, you try and design it with ideal occlusion, with bite guards, all of this stuff but they're still going to break stuff. Um, <clears throat> you said you would prefer to do a bridge in the anterior region over an implant and then noted the downside to splitting two teeth together. Is this a situation where a cantilever bridge would be appropriate? If not, why not? Okay, I can't remember the case they were referring to, but you need to, rem you need to get out of your head the idea that there is one solution that's perfect and it's correct and everything else is imperfect and incorrect. Okay, every option that we have has things that are good and things that are bad and that's just the nature of dentistry. So there's no perfect thing. Everything has some good points and some bad points. Um, in the anterior region it's easier to get perfect soft tissue volumes and it's much less likely to have a catastrophic disaster if you do a bridge rather than an implant. But I mean, then you could compare it. If the patient's got very large pulps, then they're more likely to want an implant than a bridge. Cantilever bridges reduce the issues of uh, splinting, which is that the periodontal ligament doesn't act like a normal periodontal ligament once teeth are splintered. Uh, the teeth act a little bit more like an implant. But then I've also seen cases with cantilevers on both implants and on teeth where the cantilever has rotated labially because of occlusal forces. So pretty much, everything can go wrong, you need to assess the individual case, okay? Then once you've assessed the individual case, make a decision about what you think is best and then go with it, okay? It might be right, it might be wrong, it doesn't matter, just make a decision and then have a reason, make a decision and go with it. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on the COIS dentofacial analyzer in comparison? Okay, they've both got different points. COIS one is much better for making sure you've got stuff straight because you've got the great big thing that pokes up and then the thing that goes across. Um, so the dentofacial analyzer is probably better for getting the aesthetics right, but it is probably not as good for working out things like 
hinge axis, which is important for the finer details of occlusion. So it depends what you're trying to do. If you're just trying to get the aesthetics of a wax up done, the coist is probably better. If you're trying to get a hinge axis for um, getting perfect occlusion and a bruxa, then you probably want a face bow. If you only have a face bow, then that's better, okay? If you only have a coist analyzer, that's better. Both of them are better enough. If you don't have a coist analyzer and you want something cheap, you can get a big long, uh, like a wooden skewer, very cheap, and just block it to the teeth with a bit of uh, silicon, like bite registration, so that you at least have a big level point. Because the problem with face bows is that as you tighten them up, they can cant slightly in one ear or the other, and then you have the whole occlusal plane off. <coughs> Do you issue an occlusal splint in all these cases? Almost every case I do gets an occlusal splint. Um, I usually quote on it before I start. If I forget to quote on it, I give them one for free. It's just save, like the number one thing in occlusion is give your patient a bite guard. Number two, make sure all the teeth hit at the same time. And number three, when they grind from side to side, make sure they don't hit on any delicate little corners of a porcelain that will chip off. That's basically the three rules of occlusion. Um, that's my occlusion lecture, okay, it's very short. Thank you very much, I hope that was helpful.